So in, in talking about this topic, I just wanted to comment on a couple things that were, were talked about previously. Uh, I was particularly interested in the uh, strands in Tennessee and the comments regarding that. Um, you know, sometimes we say that it's not really a learning disability, it's a teaching disability. That we're all, we're all capable of learning, but we learn in different ways. And the way in which we're instructed makes a big difference as to how we're going to do. I used to say, um, you know, we could simplify education a lot if we just figured out who our dyslexic people were and put them in the classroom that, that, that is geared to teaching to dyslexic people. Or if we found out who was on the autism spectrum and we had a classroom for people that were on the autism spectrum. It kind of defeats the point of, um, merging everybody into one pot, but if you think about elementary education, the job of kindergarten through third grade is to learn how to read, write, spell, and do math. Um, once you get into the higher grades beyond um, third grade, it's presumed that you have those basic skills in place, and you're now gonna be able to hit the ground running to do a lot of content area work. And I think where, where we fail a lot of times is in, in identifying uh, unique learning problems early and providing instruction that truly um, prevents the person from falling behind. I used to say, no child left behind was written for dyslexics. Um, <clears throat> having said that, what I want to talk about today a little bit is why we do testing, what we can figure out from testing, um, and, and how, we, how we can use tests in order to identify what kind of instructional methods are going to work the best. And if you, um, if you have questions, you might want to sort of just jump up to the mic or something like that rather than have somebody run all over the room. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so a learning disability is basically broken into a couple different components. One is that there has to be some uh, impairment in what's called a basic psychological process. What that means is that a learning disability is due to uh, something that's cognitive, something that's hardwired into the person's ner um, nervous system. And what we want to do is figure out where those processes are working well and where those processes are not working well. So uh, learning disability is not diagnosed when there's not a processing problem. For example, if a person doesn't learn to read because they were out of the country for the first eight years of their life, that's not a learning disability, that's, that's um, a, a, a difficulty with lack of education. Um, if a person is sick and they miss a lot of school and as a result they're behind academically, that's not defined as a learning disability. That's due again to, to missing educational opportunities. So one of, the, one of the key factors in determining whether a person has a learning disability or not is to figure out is there a, a place where processing is breaking down and was the problem due to some other factor like missing school or never having been instructed in the first place? Okay, the, the other component of learning disability is that it has to result in an academic problem. You can have processing problems but not have uh, deficits in achievement that need to be addressed with a certain kind of instruction. So you need, the, you need to meet those two prongs in order to have something um, classified as a learning disability. And um, wh what happens a lot of times is that, that, that determination becomes sort of a hazy area where, for example, I might test a student and find that the student has really high intelligence up here, but their achievement in reading and spelling is way down here. Okay, now I would call that an academic impact, all right? Well, school might say, well, their achievement is here, 
but it's average in comparison to other students, so we don't have to do anything about that, all right? So we get into disputes with each other about what constitutes a learning disability and what doesn't, and that's one of the things that hampers the ability to provide intervention and the right kind of instruction because of the disagreement as to whether a person should even be classified as having a problem. Okay, dyslexia is a certain type of learning disability, but it's a spectrum disorder, meaning that you can have mild to severe forms of dyslexia, and you can have some components of processing problems that dyslexic people have, but not all. So there are degrees of severity, and there are the processing problems we have to take into account. Now the reason why we do that is because there's a lot of different ways to teach a person how to read and spell. For some people, it doesn't matter what methods you use, they're gonna learn it anyway. For 5% of the population, they're already gonna know how to read and spell when they go to kindergarten, and you're not really gonna have to teach them decoding or spelling skills anyway. But for the rest of us, the, the method makes a difference. And that's where um, we, we get into some difficulty with um, teachers being trained in kind of like a one-size-fits-all approach. That, that almost never happens anywhere in life. And so, where certain people will respond well to a certain type of instruction, for example, um, whole language was brought up. Okay, whole language was in vogue um, kind of back in the 80s, um, a little bit into the 90s. And basically the premise was that all students would learn how to read if they were just exposed to good literature. And what students were encouraged to do is that if they couldn't read a word, that they should guess at it. Um, to use logic to make a logical guess. Now usually dyslexics are really good at this. It's called using context cues to make a guess. For example, you could take a, a dyslexic kid and give them the word canoe and they might spell cannot or something like that, okay? But if they're reading about Hiawatha, they're more likely to get canoe because they know they're reading about Indians, okay? That's, that's using the context to make a guess. That's not what we want dyslexic people to actually do or practice doing because what we want them to do is to be able to decode words that are not in their sight vocabulary and we want them to be able to use reading to learn about something they don't already know about. So whole language was useful for kids, that 5% of the population of students that went to school in kindergarten and already knew how to read and spell. We have a language where we take our speech sounds and we code them up with symbols. And so there are some people who learn that code very easily just by being read to as little kids. And they come to school and they already know how to read and they know how to decode and they know how to spell. Whole language is good for them because then they can pick out a lot of cool stuff to read from the library and read for comprehension. But for the other 95% of students, they actually have to have some instruction in how to, how to break this code. And, and I would say that um, public education, I think, has gotten a lot better in, in terms of general education in teaching the connections between sounds and symbols. But it's kind of a scattershot approach because it does depend on the, the level of understanding of the teacher, the teacher's training, and the teacher's ability to implement their training in the classroom where they're working. Um, teachers have to teach what their school district or state or federal government requires them to teach, okay? That's their job. They're, they're given a curriculum and they have to deliver that curriculum uh, with integrity, and they're tested on um, how well their students do in being delivered that specific curriculum. So <clears throat> if the teacher doesn't have the flexibility to work outside of that program model, then the kids who need a certain kind of instruction may not be getting it, even if the teacher would like to provide it, 
or knows that there's an obvious problem with a, with a student. So what happens is that dyslexia as a disability comes under this larger umbrella of learning disability. And we even get into disputes about whether that's used as a term. Um, if, if we look at, you know, so here's some of the things that I hear, okay? Well, dyslexia is a medical thing and we don't deal with medical problems. Actually, dyslexia can be diagnosed on an autopsy, but that's about it. It's usually an educational diagnosis. Um, some people think that dyslexia means you see everything backwards on the page. Um, there are some neurological conditions that result in that, but usually what happens more frequently is dyslex with dyslexic people is that it's not a vision problem, it's a perceptual problem with symbol directionality where it's kind of like off and on, okay? You can read the word correctly here and three lines later not be able to read the same word. So you have good and bad days. Um, you can be dyslexic and still have a vision problem, okay? There, vision is dealing with your sensory system. Dyslexia is the way your brain is wired. So you may have to do more than one thing, okay? The, the part about the brain, we need a certain type of instruction. The part about the vision, you know, possibly if you have, um, well, if you have an acuity problem, which is mostly what's picked up, you can get corrective lenses, you can get contacts, whatever, to improve your acuity, right? But if you have problems with your eyes not converging to a target on a page and picking up separate signals on that page, it can create symptoms that look like symbol confusion, but it's really that the brain is getting fed constantly changing signals. So the usual way to, to treat that is that you go to a type of specialist called a developmental optometrist or a functional optometrist and they check for how well your eyes work together as a team and is, are your eyes sending your brain a stable signal. Um, if, if not, then they will more often than not recommend something called vision therapy, which is like vi uh, physical therapy for your eyes. It's, it's, it's really literally you're doing eye exercises to improve the ocular motor function of your eyes. Now, what happens with vision therapy? Oftentimes, people will go to the vision therapist, they'll do eye exercises, their tracking and teaming will improve, they'll be converging, they won't be skipping words and lines when they're reading with print, they quit the vision therapy, and they go back to having a problem again. It's just like stopping exercises, okay? You do the exercises, they pay off. When you say, okay, I'm finished, I made my goals, I don't have to exercise anymore, <laughs> okay? Then what happens is you're, you're kind of back in hot water again. So I think a lot of the negative um, press about vision therapy is often due to the fact that the cure is not permanent. You, ha you have to continue to do some kind of level of maintenance in order to maintain those gains. If you are dyslexic and you have a vision problem on top of it, you gotta, you gotta do two things. Number one is you need the instruction to deal with the dyslexia problem. And number two, you gotta deal with the vision thing. Because if you're not, if you're not seeing print clearly on the page or your eyes are taking separate signals and sending them back into your brain, then that's going to really stall your progress in learning how to read. Um, <clears throat> the, the other issue that I see that comes up a lot is that when, when parents mention dyslexia to schools, they say, well, that's not something that we deal with here. <laughs> okay? So it's just flat out denial. It's sort of like what I call the flat earth society of dyslexia. Let's just pretend it's not there. Um, Dyslexia can manifest itself academically in different ways. Usually we talk about it as a reading disability, and I can tell you that most dyslexics can learn to read and can learn to read well. They may not read fast. Frequently dyslexics are not good spellers and stay that way. Spelling is a lot tougher to remediate. And the reason why is that, you know, when we're little and we're learning how to spell, if you're spelling accurately, your brain is storing up 
images of what a word should look like. If you're misspelling things a lot, then as you're learning or as you're progressing through school, the brain is storing up all these different spellings of words, and you don't have an internal compass to look at a word and know if it's spelled correctly or not. Good spellers know if the word is spelled correctly or not. They can, they can see it. Um, so what happens is dyslexia is one of those things where we want to catch it early, we want to intervene early with the right kind of instruction, and we really do want to prevent the child from getting behind. I often say no child was left, left behind was invented by the Bush family because Barbara Bush was the chairman of the International Dyslexia Society and a lot of the Bushes are dyslexic. <clears throat> and basically, those kids went to private schools, they were identified early and they got instruction right from the get-go. Um, <clears throat> dyslexia also affects, um, one, one of the associated problems is like finding the words to say what you want to say. You, you know the word, but you can't quite put your finger on it, okay? Usually it shows up, not when the person's talking about something they already know about. Many dyslexic people are very, very verbal. A lot of times it shows up more when they're asked a question and they go in there and they're rooting around in their heads and they can't find the word to say what they want to say, so they kind of talk around it. Um, problems with rapid naming speed. As was mentioned before, um, very simple tasks of just naming letters and numbers and looking at how fast the person can do that is a really good early screener for those problems. And when we have problems with rapid naming speed, it tends to really slow down your fluency. Because what's happening is the person's looking at those letters and they're, tr they're working hard to try to figure out what it is they're looking at. So they're not able to rapidly scan and track through print. So I, a lot of dyslexic people will tell you they don't like to read. And the reason they don't like to read is because it's so much work. It's so much physical work to do it. Um, another word we use is called orthographic processing. Orthographic means symbol. It doesn't mean that you, get, you see everything backwards. What it means is you can have unstable perception of symbols, so you get your B's and D's and P's and Q's mixed up. And so we look at these processes that are involved with reading and spelling, and we try to figure out what processes are breaking down. Because if we know the ones that are in trouble, we, we know then, or we should know, or we ought to know what the fix is. Okay, Vicki, can you, are you making a go? Okay. So, <clears throat> When, when we do an evaluation for dyslexia, we do IQ testing, and people say, well, why do we do that? Well, we do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're looking at the person's overall ability, or what I call their cognitive horsepower, all right? There are some people who have trouble learning because their, their intellectual abilities are depressed, and, and they have problems learning everything, okay? That's, that's not dyslexia. Um, we also want to look at um, it was mentioned about twice exceptional people. A twice exceptional person is a person who's really smart but has processing problems in certain areas that affect them in their learning. So we want to know what the person's ability is because we want to know what the overall expectations should be. If I've got a person of superior intelligence and they're reading in the low average range, that's really not okay, okay? They're not reading anywhere near their level of, of overall ability. So, again, where this, where this sort of comes into play in terms of the politics of all of this, all comes down to a matter of identification. Is the person identified as having a learning disability or they identified as having dyslexia? Well, the definitions keep changing, so it's kind of like shifting sands when you're trying to deal with this politically. It used to be that we would take ability, measure achievement, and if there was a big discrepancy between ability and achievement, we called it a learning disability. What was the problem with that? The problem was is if we did something that worked 
and brought the achievement up, the person no, no longer qualified as having a learning disability, even though they still had all the processing problems. The, the other problem with discrepancy is that you had to be in school long enough and fail enough to get far enough behind other people of your age. So what happened is that little kids were not identified and we couldn't do any prevention. It was kind of like a wait and see till you're in third grade before we even test you. Because we're gonna try all the general education stuff first and then we're gonna test you in third grade when things are not getting better. Well then, your discrepancy between ability and achievement has, has developed, has widened, but now we've missed what's called the critical window of language development. Little kids' brains are rapidly wiring in terms of cognition uh, for connecting uh, speech, sounds, and symbols, and a lot of other functions. Uh, language functions. And, and the critical window of language development is roughly birthed through the age 10. So what happens is if we catch a kid in the critical window, like if we catch a five-year-old who's at risk for dyslexia, they haven't developed significant gaps between ability and achievement yet because they haven't been in school. But we can identify dyslexia by the processing problems. If we do early intervention to address those problems, we can literally prevent kids from ever getting behind. And we're taking advantage of the fact that the brain is a, in a rapid wiring phase for uh, what's going on here. And so we can oftentimes beat the disability from a neurocognitive standpoint. If we take the wait and see approach and we don't do anything until third grade, that's usually when you're, you're reaching the end of the critical window phase. So now you're always gonna have a permanent problem, which is why we say, well, with dyslexia, if you don't get it by third grade, and if you don't do the right things by third grade, you're probably always going to have some difficulties down the road. Um, <clears throat> when we're doing testing for dyslexia, we, know, we not only look at cognitive horsepower, but we also look at, can you hear the phonemes and words? That's the smallest units of sound and words. Um, when phonological processing is poor, it affects not only reading in our language, but it affects you when you take foreign languages when you're older, hearing the smallest units of sound in the word. Phonological memory is, can you remember those sound units in a sequence in your short-term memory? If I sound out a word, I have to also be able to store in my short-term memory what those sound units are to do the, the sound connections. We need to look at orthographic processing. How well does the person, do they have stable perception of letters and numbers? Or do they have shifting perceptions where it's kind of on and off and haphazard? Um, we look at speeded naming, it's naming of symbols. That affects fluency. And, and what happens then is, I always say to dyslexic people is, you can get there, you're just gonna have to work three times harder than everybody else to do it. So you get fatigue problems that come into play and just kind of giving up through sheer exhaustion. We look at something called visual motor integration. Can you take what you're seeing and can you do something with it in writing? All right, there's a type of disability we call dysgraphia. All these names are Latin, okay? Dysgraphia means lousy writing, <laughs> okay? And, and then we look at receptive and expressive vocabulary, okay? Frequently what I'll see is that a person with dyslexia has good receptive vocabulary when it's a single word and knowing the meaning of that word. But they also frequently have problems with auditory overload where if you give them a series of directions, take out this book, go to page 35, write down the words, put them in a sentence, this kid's taken out the book and then will hear the rest of it, okay? So they get identified as having attention deficit disorder, right? Or they're asking their neighbor, what book, what page, what am I doing? Okay, so they look like they have an attention problem, and they may, have an, you can have dyslexia and an attention problem, but it, it's what we call a problem with auditory overload. There's too much coming at me at one time and I can't process it as quickly as it's coming. 
So it's not a receptive language problem per se because the person understands the language. It's a problem with too much language coming at one time to process. Um, the other thing I want to mention are, are the kinds of tests we use, okay? There's what's called curriculum-based tests and there's norm reference tests. A psychologist like me uses what we call a norm reference test, all right? A norm reference test means I'm testing a kiddo and I'm comparing that kiddo to other kids of the same age in North America, all right? So I'm looking at this big pot of people and I'm saying, where is this particular kid in either this aspect of learning or, um, or, or this aspect of cognitive functioning? Where are they in relation to this big pot of other people in the same age? All right. The reason we do that is because it gives us a larger perspective like, your kid isn't just going to stay in one elementary school for the rest of their life. They're hopefully going to go out into the world and have to deal with other people. So whether they're doing OK in their classroom, that's a good thing. But are they able to compete in a, in a wider domain of people where certain skills are expected at certain age ranges? Curriculum-based tests are tests that are, are tied to the curriculum. So an example would be, here's your list of spelling words on Monday. Study them all week. Here's your test on Friday. What do dyslexic people do? They get the words, they study the words, they get OK in the test, and three weeks later, they can't spell the words. OK? So they, they did OK in the curriculum-based test, right? So we don't have a problem. But we know that they're not retaining the correct spellings of words. We do have a problem. So this is where things get sort of tangled up in the analysis, is we have to figure out what's going on, to what degree it's going on, and then how to do the fix. OK. Um, <clears throat> when we have a person who has trouble with the sounds of the language, they will oftentimes over-rely on recognizing sight words, right? Dyslexic people can be taught um, sight words, like stop and the Pizza Hut sign and the Michelin sign and things like that, okay? The, it, it, dyslexia is not a problem of sight word identification. It's a problem of sounding out a word that you don't identify as a sight word. That's why part of the way we test is we give the person nonsense words so they can't rely on sight words to guess at the word. Um, the other problem with phonological processing is that the person will often over rely on context cues like the canoe versus cannot. They'll take what they're reading and they'll comprehend okay if they can read and reread the material because what they're using is they're using the framework of what they're reading about to make educated guesses. That's not reading decoding, though. That's making educated guesses. And that's what we usually find with dyslexic people is that their comprehension is frequently a lot better than their decoding skills because they're, they're relying on context cues or the overview in the classroom or what you're talking about in the classroom to, to get it. Um, I have dyslexic students I've worked with who know all the science and, and history and what have you, but they got it from TV. They didn't get it from reading about it, and they didn't get it from listening to a lecture in the classroom. So <clears throat> what, what the core deficit of dyslexia, though, is, is that you have trouble decoding a word that isn't in your sight vocabulary. And that blocks your comprehension because you're not able to use reading to learn about something you don't already know about. I thought I heard somebody, but I guess that was a sneeze. <laughs> okay. Um, the distractibility I mentioned with auditory overload, the word finding difficulties we talked about. Okay, what happens with orthographic processing problems? Symbol confusion is off and on. It's frequently not everything is backwards. It's, it's uh, what looks like careless mistakes. 
And that's what people often assume, is if you tried harder, you wouldn't do this. And the reason I know that is because you read the word correctly here, so how come you're not reading it down here? It's not carelessness, it's sort of an on and off event. When you have the orthographic component, the sound comp or the symbol component, it often affects math as well. There are a lot of dyslexics, like Sarah Page, who are good at math, but there are a lot of dyslexics who are not good at math. And the reason why is because the symbol um, perceptual problem affects working with math symbols too. If you think of it, you know, in our language we read this way, right? but we do math this way. So what happens is that if you get confusion of your left and rights, that can often affect not only the reading, not only the letter identification, not only the orthographic processing, but the math symbols as well. And what we'll see in math oftentimes is the person's okay if they have like single digit addition, but once they have double and triple addig uh, uh, digits or we have algebra when we've got uh, letters and numbers and all of that, then we get a lot more problem with the math areas. Um, usually there are problems with spelling, capitalization, punctuation. The person may just leave them out. They'll inconsistently spell words. Um, and, and what people do is when they're writing, we tend, to, we tend to use the words that we can say when we're talking, right? But when we're writing, we try to use words that we can spell, especially if we know we're going to be graded on spelling. So what happens is that you'll often see in the writing of people with dyslexia is that they kind of dumb down their writing because they're trying to use words that they think they can spell. And then you'll get all these inconsistent errors where you can read the word correctly and then you can't. Okay, <clears throat> so the, the kinds of associated problems that often go along with dyslexia are what we call dysgraphia, which is Latin for lousy writing, but uh, oftentimes we'll see problems with the writing itself. It, in schools these days, um, cursive writing is being dropped from a lot of um, teaching, which is too bad because it's really hard to make reversals when you're writing cursive. Cursive, cursive writing is actually often very helpful to learn for a dyslexic person because, especially if they, if they have a tendency to make reversal errors. Um, people have what we call graphomotor problems. What does that mean? It means your hand gets tired when you're writing or you have trouble controlling the pencil and you, and you get so tired that you can sort of see the writing deteriorate the longer the person writes. Okay, that's part of dysgraphia. Um, we have endurance problems with writing because of fatigue. Um, we have lots of problems as uh, with when you've got graphomotor problems and fatigue with writing. Lots of difficulty when you make that transition from elementary school into middle school and high school. Because what happens? In elementary school, the teacher teaches the kids. In middle school and high school, the teachers teach their subjects. And so what happens is now you've gone from a situation where you had a primary teacher or two who taught you and you kind of adapted to each other. Now you're into a situation where you've got six or seven teachers, all that are teaching their subjects and all that have different demands. So you have to be able to organize your stuff, get through all the reading, and do all the writing assignments. So if you have trouble keeping up with writing, if you fatigue out when you're writing, what happens? You end up putting out fires. You take the big emergency subject and you put your effort into that one and then three others go down the tubes. Um, slow completion of work, difficulty keeping up, inability to listen and take notes simultaneously. These are all other kinds of problems that can travel along with dyslexia. Dyscalculia is the Latin term for math problems. Trouble with multi-step math problems. Uh, frequently people will have, develop a lot of anxiety around math so that they just 
get it in their heads that they can't do it and they just try to avoid it and they get really anxious with t taking math tests. A lot of difficulty with the way math is being taught in school right now. Most people who are parents know that math is not being taught the way they learned it. And what happens is that if you try to show your child the way you learned it, they will tell you they can't do it that way. They're not allowed to. So right now, a big focus in math is um, what I call like a theoretical math curriculum, where many concepts are being presented in one lesson with the idea being that you're going to develop a sense of the ability to work with math and math symbols. The problem is there's a lot of people that learn math best by learning the formula and practicing it to death. And we're missing those kids who learn that way. They're not getting math, not because they're not mathematical, but because they're being taught probability and estimation and they don't really know how to get the answer. Um, <clears throat> Trouble with carrying, borrowing, algebra, uh, numbers and letters. These are all things that may also be associated with dyslexia. So as you see, dyslexia can go from a problem with just single word reading, but it can expand out to cover a lot of different areas. And people are, are all different. So the reason why we, we, we do testing is to figure out what are the pieces that of, of problem that are going on and what are the ways that we can address these problems? Can you get, okay. Um, <clears throat> if a person is dyslexic, the, the number one piece that we want to look at is to provide what we call synthetic phonetic instruction. The big umbrella is called an Orton-Gillingham approach, okay? That's an old method that goes back where you're just explicitly teaching how to form the sound and symbol connections. There are other methods that come under that umbrella, but the, the basic premise is that you're teaching the structure of the language systematically. You're teaching the sounds. You're teaching how the sounds pair up and combine. You're teaching how to make the sound and symbol connections explicitly. You're not expecting that the person will just get it by reading a good book. Um, <clears throat> with spelling, you have to put in a different piece because if you just teach spelling phonetically, you're going to be R-O-N-G. Um, we, we have a phonetic language with speech sounds, but when we code them up with symbols, it's a whole different ball game, right? You have to be able to look at the word and know that it is correct, all right? And so it involves a strong orthographic component. Um, usually what we're looking at is, you know, the recommended intervention for teaching literacy skills in a classroom is about 120 minutes a day. And oftentimes what we see is that the, the instruction is being provided, but there's not enough of it. You really need to have intensive instruction, and we want to front load this, meaning that we want to identify these problems early, we want to do what's going to work early so the child doesn't get behind. And they establish these basic skills so they've got a toolbox of academic skills to take forward with them when they go into middle school and high school. You're still not going to get rid of the processing problems associated with dyslexia, but believe me, if you have the academic skills in place, the basic skills in place, that goes really far in, in helping the person be successful. When we have big time problems is when we've got all the processing problems still, but the academic skills are not there. So now we have to look at making up these big gaps between where the person should be and where they actually are, in addition to doing everything else they have to do. And so sometimes we'll look at this and say, well, we can put a tutor in. The problem is, is that the student is still re responsible for everything else they have to do in the day. 
They're probably exhausted when they get home from school because they've been working really hard to try to keep up. And now we're going to put tutoring in at the end of the day to fix this, okay? Oftentimes, there's just not enough hours in the day or enough energy to really put into what you have to do to remediate those skill sets. So it gets infinitely more complicated as you move up age-wise from the point of identif identifying what's going on to what we do about um, addressing it. Um, when we have um, the orthographic component of dyslexia, the symbol component, if we add in an instructional method called RAVO, RAVO, when it goes along with an Orton-Gillingham method, is really designed for your person to get their symbols really screwed up. You'll tend to get more gain if you combine up an Orton-Gillingham approach with a RAVO approach. The, the downside is RAVO can only be used up through fifth grade. But it's particularly useful to get, a, to get a bounce and to get more traction out of the intervention when you've got a person who's got a lot of symbol confusion. Um, with dysgraphia, you can work on training and penmanship. I mentioned the differences between cursive and uh, manuscript. But you also want to teach the person how to write, and you also want to train them in how to use technology. Because, let's face it, you can be the smartest kid in your class, but if you don't know how to write, that's what you're going to get graded on. You get graded on your written work, you get graded on your written tests, and so when the problems affect writing, it can really mess up your life. So we want to, the, the rule of thumb is always remediate everything you can and teach the work around for what you can't remediate. Okay? So let's say that we've got a, a kiddo who has a lot of trouble reading, spelling, writing, and they're kind of maxing out at the higher elementary grades, and they don't have the toolbox they need of skills that they need to go into middle school. Right? What we want to do is we want to focus on remediating the basic skills to the extent we can, knowing that if we do all the right things, we're probably going to get our biggest bounce in reading. May get some gains in spelling, but there's going to still be a lot of spelling problems. And we're going to have to live with them. So the way we live with them is we use technology to make ourselves look good in writing, even though we can't spell. Okay. So it becomes, you know, how you approach this problem varies from the age and the grade level of the person that you're working with. If you're a little kid who's been identified as a five-year-old, you can use, uh, for example, Wilson Foundations, which is a pre prevention program for uh, smart dyslexic kids that are little. And oftentimes, that'll work to get everything established, and they're never identified as having a learning disability. If you're a kid in eighth grade, and your reading is on the second grade level, and your spelling is worse, and you're not that great at math, too, now we've got a real problem, because you're expected to do all this content area work, and you don't have your basic skills in place to do it. So, Despite the regulations and, and everybody's you know, debate about what do we call this and how bad is it and what are we going to do and are we just going to use accommodations or are we going to use remediation, the answers to those questions depend a lot on where the person is in their life cycle, what the demands are on them in terms of how they have to perform in school and elsewhere, and what skills they've established and which ones do they have yet to catch up on. Okay. <clears throat> with um, public schools, what, um, what they do is a lot of what we call progress monitoring, okay? And one of the areas that's looked at is fluency. How many words can a child read per minute? Um, with a dyslexic person, we really don't want to stress fluency yet. We want them to learn how to decode. We, want them to get, we don't want them to rush through and go through really fast. We don't want them to read and reread and reread the same material just so they can go faster when they're doing it. We want them to learn how to decode. So sometimes what we, what we emphasize is um, 
is not the right thing. Even though it's important to work toward fluency, um, our fluency tends to vary anyway, even without a, a disability. Fluency varies depending on the difficulty level of what you're reading, right? If you're reading um, a, a Nancy Drew book, for example, okay, or something like that, just a you know, basic little text or a Jack and Jill book or something like that, you don't have to, you can, you can read that quickly because there's not a lot of content, but if you're reading an insurance policy or a legal agreement, it's going to take you a lot longer to get through that, right? So you don't necessarily want to rush through reading the insurance policy or the legal agreement. It actually helps to be able to slow yourself down and get it. So <clears throat> when, we're, when we're working on, on these skill sets, we want to work on fluency, but we want to work on fluency in the context of the difficulty of what you're reading about. And we know that if you're reading text that is really difficult anyway, it's going to slow your fluency down anyway. Um, if I'm a college student and I'm taking a course in creative writing or literature and I have really difficult text of poetry that uses a lot of metaphors and abstract terms and I'm dyslexic and I have trouble reading anyway, that's going to like completely wreck me and consume all of my time because the difficulty level is so high that the person could only uh, kind of get through the class if that was the only class they were taking and that was the only thing they were doing. So you do have to sort of parse out. We, we want the person to be able to work at a rate that they can be successful and they can get the information in but we want them to have their basic skills in place and we able to want them to employ them with integrity before we, we ever push speed. So I think we ought to probably take speed right out of the equation of what we look at. We can look at it as a gauge for uh, a predictor of who's going to have more trouble than other people. Um, fluency rates can, pr can predict problems, but they're rarely the solution to fixing a problem. Um, <clears throat> other kinds of things that we, we, we don't want to do, if you, if you are a dyslexic person, you usually dread being called on to read out loud in front of your classmates. Um, when, when we ha listen to a student with dyslexia read out loud, we hear all the mistakes. Now, I work with people who are dyslexic, but they are reading, they've got the reading down, they know how to decode, but when they read out loud, you hear their mistakes. And I will often say to them, you're reading, you know the rules of decoding, you're comprehending well when given enough time, you're not good at reading out loud because that's where your mistakes show up. You can fix this or you can do nothing about it. If you're going to work in radio or TV, or if you're going to be reading from a teleprompter or something like that, it's probably worth trying to work on your oral reading accuracy. If you're not going to be reading out loud, you can let this go because you've got your basic skills down. You can read, you can decode, you can comprehend. So those are the core things we're going for, and fluency is kind of at the, at the end of the road. Um, when students have a lot of reading to do, having audio text can be really, really helpful. And having audio text can also be helpful when you're reading for comprehension just to hear the way something should be read. So what you want to do is not use the audio exclusively. You want to use the audio as you're following along in the text so that you are hearing how the text should sound um, and, and some of those um, audio reading programs are better than others. Um, Learning Ally, for example, tends to sound like more natural speech um, than Bookshare, which tend to sound more robotic. So um, getting books in, in an audio form 
You don't necessarily want to do that for every subject, but in, if you have a lit course and you have to get through five novels in a semester or something like that, then using the audio is really um, important. Um, you want to learn how to use technologies to compensate um, because especially with writing, you, not only the, the uh, listening to audio text, but especially with writing, you want to be able to use technology because you're graded on writing so often that you know, if you're able to dictate your report and you're writing a scientific paper on amoebas and you know, things that have weird spellings, um, if, you, if you learn how to dictate and you use a, a spell check and a grammar check program, you're able to produce writing that looks a lot better than if you just tried to write it out yourself. So usually what I suggest is that for dyslexic people, we focus on um, remediation, we focus on getting all the basic skills down, but we also teach how to do the workaround because we want the person to hit the ground running when they go to middle school and high school. We want them to know how to use the technology so they can survive in the courses that they have and be productive and, and show their, their ability in a, in a positive way, but we also want to teach them how to do the no technology route. We don't want to jump in too soon, for example, like math. So, um, a lot of times I'll recommend that a student use a calculator, but I usually also say that as a negotiating point with teachers because it's also important for the student to be able to show their work, right? So I'll say, well, how about if this kid does the first row of problems where they show their work and they do the rest with a calculator and they learn two skills, okay? So they're showing their work, they're showing you can do the logic of the stepwise calculations, but they're getting done and they're also learning how to use a calculator to do it. So some of, some of this has to be a negotiation and a trade-off depending on what the objectives are for the, for the student. We don't want to just teach a person how to use technology to write, but not have them be able to write anything out um, in a traditional way. Um, with dysgraphia, we want to emphasize whole word spelling, which is where you see an image of the word. You don't spell it phonetically. Um, you can do some words phonetically, but a lot of them, they have to be memorized as sight words. We want to grade on the amount of writing the person has produced rather than on um, not, not on how much, but on the content of what they've done. I'd rather see a good, well-written paragraph than three lousy written ones. Um, cut back on the quantity, emphasize the quality of what the person is doing so they can get the skill sets down. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, when we, when we address the associated disabilities, like the word finding problem, there, there are programs you can use to improve word finding. I usually suggest just give the person additional wait time to let them find the words to say what they want to say. Um, there's, there's cognitive retraining programs for short-term auditory working memory problems. Um, for example, there's something called CogMed training, which when, when you hear cognitive retraining, it means you're working on improving a brain-based skill. It's not an academic remediation. So if a person has a stroke, okay, what you hear about them doing is cognitive retraining. You're training other uninjured parts of your brain to do something, right? Well, there is cognitive training that you can do for hearing phonemes and words better. Usually if we do that, it works better when you're in that critical window of birth to 10, when you're forming up those, those connections in the brain. If we do working memory training, you know, what I, what I see is, is it can work for somebody who's incredibly invested in it and really puts in the time and the energy and the effort. If they don't do that, there's no sense in paying for it. And for a lot of people, it's just terribly boring. <laughs> So, again, you have to look at your, your trade-offs. Um, with math, 
oftentimes going back to a math curriculum that is more of a stepwise approach to learning the procedures for solving a problem, practicing them to death before you go on to the next one, and following a developmental sequence from addition on up works better for people with dyslexia and associated learning disabilities than a theoretical math curriculum. You need a lot of drill, you need a lot of repetition, you need a lot of practice to get these skills down to their automatic. Um, the other thing we have to do sometimes with math is we have to remove the extra information. You know, you can take a math word problem and throw something in there you don't need, and that can totally throw a person um, off who's trying to solve the problem or figure out the steps they need to solve it. You go to the next one, Vicki? Okay. Um, the other thing with math, oftentimes um, what we'll see for a person who has like an orthographic processing problem is that um, if they circle the sign before they do the problem, it orients their attention to what they're doing. Um, there are some kids who will just uh, look at a page and they're, they're mixed problems of different operations and they'll go and they'll add or subtract everything but they won't be paying attention to the operational sign or they'll add when the sign said subtract. Oftentimes if you just have the child circle the sign first to orient their attention to that, you can get around that problem. Okay. You can go to the next one, Vicki. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about an IEP versus a 504 plan. An IEP means that we are, we are delivering instruction that isn't part of what everybody else gets, okay? General education, you get whatever is in vogue at the time, period. And in general education, you know, you can, you can talk to the teacher, you can negotiate with the teacher, but basically you get what everybody else gets, right? In special education, the key with the IEP is you get two columns, okay? Column one is what specially designed instruction are we gonna put into place to work with whatever we're working on, okay? And that, you know, should be explicit. I know in IEPs it's often not. Oftentimes we'll look at the specially designed instruction and it'll say, we're pulling out this person for reading for 30 minutes a day. Well, okay, what are you doing in the 30 minutes, okay? How do, I, how do I sign a contract and agree to a contract of what you're proposing if you're not telling me what you're gonna do, all right? Method makes a difference. And so keeping that information out of an IP to say, well, we're just gonna call it a reading disability, and we're gonna say, we're gonna pull your child out of the classroom, and we're gonna work with them on reading, and see how they do if we pull them out, I wouldn't sign a contract that agrees to that. Why not? I want to know, well, what are you doing that's different than what didn't work before? And what's the research basis for, for doing what, what you're proposing to do? Now, if they tell me, well, we use a lot of different things, okay, we don't use one thing. Again, you're, you're, you're agreeing to, when, when you have an IEP, the IEP puts the school and the parents on the same plane legally. What it means is that you have a say in your child's education. It isn't like a general education student where you just get whatever is being done, okay? The IEP is a tool that allows you to work with the district to figure out what kind of instruction are we gonna try that makes sense? How are we gonna monitor the progress your child is making to see if it's working? And what are we gonna do if it's not working? Okay, so if I'm going to target an intervention to work on some problem, I wanna know what I'm targeting it with. Because if somebody says, well, we just use a lot of different stuff, that doesn't give me a lot of confidence that anything is going to happen that's different than what happened in the general education class. Um, 
the other column of an IEP, in addition to the specially designed instruction, are the accommodations, okay? If I give your kid a 10-word spelling list instead of a 20-word list, well, number one, I'm, I'm chopping their spelling instruction in half, okay, so they're getting half of what everybody else gets. But what I'm basically doing is dumbing down the instruction, right? If I'm, if I'm doing that as an accommodation, I'm not teaching your child how to spell. I'm just saying they don't have to spell as many words. So what happens a lot of times is you'll look at an IEP and what you'll see is it's very long on accommodations. We'll give you extra time. We'll give you preferential seating so the teacher can clue you back in if you lose your attention. We'll give you less spelling words. We'll give you less math problems to do. We'll have the test read out loud to you so you don't have to read it yourself. Okay? Accommodations are important, but what we want to do is we want to empower the student with the tools they need to do it themselves. So the specially designed instruction piece of the IEP is really the key especially for younger kids. When, as students get older, like let's take a, you know, a perfect trajectory. Good trajectory is you identify the problem early, you do all the specially designed instruction up front so the child never gets behind, you start making accommodations, like for example, you might say, well, you can take a foreign language if you really want to, but we're gonna grade you pass-fail so it doesn't trash your GPA because we know you're dyslexic and it's probably gonna be your hardest subject, okay? That's an accommodation so that if the person wants the instruction, they can get it, but we're not gonna like ruin their life by having them fail foreign language and not graduate because they couldn't pass the foreign language class. By the way, dyslexics, if they take a foreign language, the best one to take is Latin because it's the most, most mathematical and it helps you with the English language. A lot of schools are bringing that back. And I actually encourage dyslexic students to take um, Latin because it can really help them a lot with language in general. Um, the Section 504 plan, the, 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 the IEP, um, comes under a federal rule called IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, okay? And, and that law is in effect until the student hits 21 years of age. Meaning that technically, if your student didn't have their basic skills in place, they can stay in school like beyond the age of 18. Almost none of them want to. But <clears throat> in any event, the, the IEP comes under um, IDEA. The IEP is supposed to contain two main ingredients, specially designed instruction, accommodations, and assistance. Okay? A 504 plan is an accommodation plan only. It comes under uh, the Office of Civil Rights. So accommodation only means we'll give you extra time. We're not changing your instruction will require less of you. We'll, we won't take off points for spelling errors. We won't take off points for problems in punctuation. We'll have a proofreader check your work, and you can go back and fix everything that you had as a mistake, and then you'll get a better grade. Okay, those are all accommodations. They don't, they're, they're not the cure. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have an IEP in place, until we get all the basic skills down, and then we'll, we'll shift more toward accommodations as the student is older, so that they can have access to general education programs, to the curriculum, to whatever they're doing in, in college and high school, but they've got the workaround in place that they can, they can employ. For example, lots of dyslexic students will have to take less than a full credit load of classes when they're in college because, especially if they have a, a subject that they're majoring in that requires a lot of reading and writing, they may only be able to take 9 to 12 credits in a semester. They may not be able to do a full, full load, and it may take them six years to get through a four-year program because there's, they've got the skills, but they're slower at doing it, and it takes them longer. And they fatigue out because they get really tired. I had one student that called me and said, 
well, you got me double time on my test, which is great, but I just found out I have three finals in one day. They're all six-hour finals. They're usually three-hour finals, but I get six, and there's no way that I can do 18 hours worth of finals in one day. Okay, the extended time wasn't a good enough thing. It had to be no, no more than one test in a day. So the accommodations have to be reasonable accommodations that you can support, and they will carry you the whole way up through, through college. So when you have, um, let's say that there's a dispute involved, okay? You don't agree with an IEP, or you're not getting an IEP, or you get an IEP that doesn't really say anything, okay? That's handled through a process called due process, which I won't go into in a lot of detail, but that all comes under the IDEA regulations. When you have a problem with reasonable accommodations, that comes under the Office of Civil Rights. That's, that's federal. Okay? Okay, let's go to the next one. I forget where we are. Okay. Um, <clears throat> What are the obstacles? I see a lot of problems with parents saying, well, the school told me that they're, they don't want to evaluate yet, they want to try some other things. Um, th there's a, a component piece involved in a lot of states, including Pennsylvania, called response to intervention or tiered intervention, as refer was referred to before. That's general education where we're just sort of turning up the heat to try to work more intensively on some skill sets, right? And that's reasonable to try in the beginning, but not to be a be-all and end-all. You don't want to be talking that, that whole tiered RTI thing all up through third grade and saying, we're not going to do anything in specially designed instruction until you're like in fourth grade. Now we've missed the critical window and and now's where the content is really turning on and the student doesn't have the toolbox they need to, to really do what they need to do. So <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to get kids evaluated early. We want to figure it out early. There is a provision in the law, this is mostly what I do, where if you have an evaluation done by your district and the results and conclusions just don't make sense to you, or they're not describing the kid that you have, or the school's telling you there is no problem, but you know there is, you do have a right to ask for an independent educational evaluation at district expense. Not something that's talked about very often by schools, but that is a right. And I would say probably at least half the students I see these days that are in public schools, it's the district that's funding the evaluation. Okay, another thing on the vision therapy piece. Usually you will hear when you talk vision therapy to a lot of people, we don't do that, we don't have anything to deal with with that, all right? Federal law was just passed a couple years ago that says if a student needs vision therapy and a qualified vision specialist determined they need vision therapy to be able to process printed information on a page, the district has to pay for it as a related service. Not well known. <laughs> And, and, and most districts I talk to have no clue about that, that law, but that's federal law now. Um, as we'll talk about later today, there's a whole lot of confusion about just the word dyslexia. People think that it's something other than it is. It sort of reminds me of when you talk about hypnosis and they see a person with a purple cape and a thing that goes back and forth in front of your eyes. Um, you know, dyslexia, it's been, it's probably the best understood learning disability that there is. It's well understood by all the units that we have to assess. It's well understood by what do we do to address it. It's very well understood, and yet you use that word and people look at you like you have three heads. So th this, you know, just the word, I try to get people to use the word because if you use the word dyslexia, you have implicitly agreed to do the instructional components that you need to address the needs of a dyslexic person. Um, with IEPs, one of the biggest problems is that they don't pass what we call the stranger test, okay? 
The stranger test means a person should be able to pick up that IEP, know exactly what to do with that student, how to implement it, how to test them to see if they're making progress. They should have enough information that everybody knows what's happening when. All right? If it can't pass the stranger test, meaning you look at the IEP and you really have no clue what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, and how they're going to see if it works, then you can't agree to it. You, you, you can't consent to something that, where you don't have enough information. Um, teacher training is a really big issue because a lot of teachers have, um, a lot of education in this country is kind of fad-based a little bit. It's kind of driven by publishers. And what happens is things go in and out of vogue, like whole language produced a whole lot of people that couldn't spell or read very well. And they weren't dyslexic, okay? It was the type of instruction that the child received. So um, what happens if you get a teacher who is trained in whole language and they believe in whole language, meaning that it's that, that or, or nothing, um, you'll often get a lot of resistance to even using the word dyslexia, or you'll have a lot of response like, well, I never heard what that word meant, or it's not in our regulations, or it's not something we have to cover. Right? None of those things are true. Um, another big issue is that the district will say, okay, we'll implement a program like the Wilson Reading System, but they won't. They might have had a teacher that had a two-day overview of the Wilson program. They weren't trained in it or they're not implementing it the way it was intended to be implemented. So sometimes what happens is you've got the IEP, it says you're getting Wilson instruction, you think you're getting that, and you're not getting that. That's another big hole. Um, vague objectives. Um, this child will achieve X, Y, and Z. I mean, I read some objectives and goals and IEPs, and I have no idea what they're saying. It, it looks like a Christmas wish list. Johnny will do this, Johnny will do that, okay? There's nothing about what we're going to do to get Johnny to do this, okay? We can all agree on what the goal is. What we can't agree is on is what are you going to do to get us to the goal? Um, so what you want to do with dyslexia especially is make sure that if you do go outside and get an independent opinion that you're using somebody who actually knows what it is. <laughs> and gets it because there are pl plenty of evaluators too that don't know what it is. Okay. Got the next one, Vicki. Okay, I put in, um, I don't know, do you have handouts that have like hyperlinks in them and stuff? Okay, I put in some hyperlinks um, for uh, like Pearson Clinical, which is where a lot of our tests come from. They have like a whole dyslexia toolkit that can be used. Um, these are just some resources for teachers. If you go to the next one, Vicki. Um, yeah, in the afternoon, um, I will be talking about the early intervention piece a little bit more, and also the whole thing about the, the D word, and I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Um, you'll probably have to jump up to a microphone, otherwise I won't be able to hear you. I have a question about foreign language. Um, you had mentioned it briefly, and I've kind of, like, I understand that some colleges require it, some don't, some high schools do, some don't. What have you seen the as... The foreign language? Yeah, what have you seen as potential, um, what has worked in high schools that require it? What have you seen work, I guess is the question. There, uh, if your student has an IEP, um, then it doesn't matter if it's required, you can just waiver them from the foreign language. Um, the, there, there can't technically be a foreign language requirement for graduation. I, I realize a lot of districts do have a foreign language requirement anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, what you, you know, what usually what I'll suggest is like get an evaluation that says that you have to be away from the foreign language provided with replacement classes. There is a test called the Modern Language Aptitude Test. It's not modern at all. It's like you can hear doors slamming in the background and everything. It's a horrible test. Um, lasts exactly an hour, but a lot of the colleges will use that to do foreign language waivers in college programs where they require a foreign language. I've seen a lot of um, 
college students who weren't able to get their degree because their program had a foreign language requirement. One of them worked for uh, George Bush, and he, uh, I guess when the Bush II regime kind of went out, um, he couldn't find a job because we had been in this recession, and that's when everybody found out he never got his degree, and he never got his degree because he couldn't pass the foreign language requirement. Um, so he flew in from Texas, and we did the modern language aptitude test, and then we dealt with the person he called the Wicked Witch of the West, who um, was in charge of his program, who then gave him the waiver. Um, so you have to, you need to be aware of the laws and when people are telling you things that are legally required versus not. Um, as far as I know, there is no legal requirement for a foreign language in a school district. It's more based on policy. Our policy is that we require um, foreign language instruction. And, and um, things like that that are uh, policy oriented can be refuted. There, but there's nothing in terms of graduation requirements or anything like that that I'm aware of at the state or federal level that requires a foreign language. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, my school this year declassified dyslexia as a dirty word and we started using it more. Um, Come over to this <laughs> microphone, will you? <laughs> I'm still losing you. Sorry, I'm a little congested. Um, right. In the IEP itself, should we be seeing the word dyslexia or does that, or dysgraphia, does, or that depend on the evaluator doing it? Frequently, um, schools will not write the word dyslexia in an IEP. I usually sort of push for it to call it what it is. Because when you call it what it is, you then bring in this whole body of background literature and support to why it is you have to teach a person this way and not just sort of the general education way. Um, but, you know, you encounter a lot of resistance to using the word. And, you know, right down to the point where they will say, well, an IEP isn't covered under the school regulations. Well, it's been in Pennsylvania's regulations since 1990. So it's there, um, there's just, I, I think the resistance to using the term primarily means that if you use the term, you have to use the instruction that is required, and if you don't use the term, then you can just stay vague and say, well, it's a learning disability, which doesn't tell you a whole lot. Because when it comes to ERs, like reading those, I've never seen that used either. So I don't know if it's coming from the person doing the evaluation because they're just not using it. Maybe they've been told not to use it. Like uh, it can be at, all, you, all of the above. No, you would recognize it as the person doing the evaluation. It can be the person doing the evaluation. It can be the school district's policy. We never use this word. Um. Okay, I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is there a rule of thumb? on when to start with assistive, uh, assistant uh, technology? Um, there's not a rule of thumb, but I think there are practical um, considerations. Uh, if you are, you know, it, it, it depends a lot on the individual, but like let's say that you have a student who's in early elementary school. Normally, we don't want to get into a lot of technology then because we really want to use our time to really build the skills and teach the skill sets. So where I see the use of the assistive technology coming in is more when we're looking at you understand the how of what you have to do. You know how to read. You get how to spell, even though you might not be a great speller. You can, you can do math. You, you've, you've got the basics down, but you need to be able to make your output faster, or you need to be more efficient, okay? It's frequently as you're coming up toward the higher grades where you've got multiple teachers and multiple task demands. Yeah, thanks. 
But if you have a person, for example, who's physically handicapped and they're in a very young grade, um, you're going to be using assistive technology to deal with the physical handicap. So it gets complicated. Yeah. Hi. Um, could you, you mentioned uh, the benefit of reading for uh, two very young children mm -hmm. before they get into school. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, what are they, what is a young child learning so that, you, when they get into the classroom, just by an adult reading to them a lot. Um, can, can you just talk well, about that benefit again? You know, we, we, we want to teach kids to love books, OK? We don't want to teach them necessarily to love cartoons and TV and video games and all that stuff. They'll, they'll do that anyway. But we also want them to be able to hear somebody reading. We want to be able to he them to be able to hear people reading things the correct way. Um, so it, it's really, you know, it, the way that we develop our vocabulary knowledge when we're little is from people talking to us. The more time you spend with your child reading and doing other activities and talking to them, the better they're going to learn language at an early age. Once you hit school age, the way you really build your vocabulary is by being a good reader. In fact, there's something that we call the Matthew effect, which is when your IQ scores go down over time, because you're not learning the vocabulary because you're not reading, and so you don't do well on tests that require a lot of verbal learning. So what you want to do is incorporate as much language into the child's life, where you're talking to them all the time, you're reading to them, you're working with letters, you're working with sound and symbol connections. You know, you're exposing them to a lot of that um, right from the get-go. Thank you. I'm going to be deaf. Um, I had a question. If a student is diagnosed with dyslexia and dysgraphia from an outside provider outside of the school district, and then they present that information to the school, is the school required to then provide the IEP, or do they need to go through the 504 process to get that st student what they need? Schools are required to consider the results okay. of an outside evaluation, which means they don't have to agree. <laughs> um, you don't, there is no requirement to go through a 504 uh, process before an IEP. Okay. In fact, I usually suggest you don't. Because the 504, the accommodations you want to put in place is when all the basic skills have been established, and now you're just using accommodations to help the person be more efficient. Okay. We don't want to just go with accommodations because really all we're doing is we're reducing requirements on the person rather than teaching them the skills. So if, if there are academic needs that need specially designed instruction, I always push for an IEP. Okay. Thank you. But that doesn't mean that schools agree with me. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a parent. Um, I just had a question about like children with multiple disabilities, like my son. Um, how do you, do you find that there's more of a delay in the diagnosis of dyslexia in kids with multiple disabilities, especially with the speech disorders? Yeah, I mean, well, there's a delay in diagnosis of dyslexia no matter what. Right. So, I, you know, I mean, j just getting there is a huge leap, but. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the multiple problems, um, sometimes some of the learning disabilities kind of take a back seat to them. So, I, I mean, I just look at it as everybody's an individual, and what you really want to do is craft the instructional program around the person you're working with to try to maximize their, their growth and development. I just had a quick question. Since we do see a lot of evaluations that just so, show a reading disability but don't yeah. diagnose dyslexia, what percentage would you say of those broad reading issues can be um, typically are dyslexia? Well, the, the general rule of thumb is that 20% of the entire population has dyslexia right. at some degree, okay? But, you know, the problem that I have with calling something a reading disability, dyslexia is not a problem of comprehension. Okay, is that what you would use to distinguish it? But I mean, if they're having yeah. problems decoding, and that's shown in the in the evaluation as right. part of a reading disability, you 
Well, it is a reading disability. It's a decoding disability. I mean, the, the key is, is to, it, it, I don't fight so much over the word dyslexia. I fight over what's a specially designed instruction being put into place. Okay. I, the reason I'll use the word is because I want to zoom the person into what the real problems are. You know, dyslexia is the, de the decoding and the encoding part. Comprehension problems are a different animal altogether. In fact, if you look at people with high functioning autism spectrum disorders versus dyslexics, they're like mirror opposites. Your, your person with high functioning autistic spectrum disorder often can read and can spell but they're not comprehending and they have trouble socially. Your dyslexic person, they can comprehend, they can't read and spell and they're usually, you know, pretty good with social. So it's, it's yeah, mirror opposites. I have a question for young students. So mm -hmm. uh, my son is in kindergarten and he has a few warning signs of dyslexia. And if I wait for the school, or a, an evaluation, I'll be waiting until third grade. But if I chose to just hire a tutor, am I missing out on opportun of an evaluation identifying needs that he could have later? Am I closing a door that is... The problem with hiring a tutor first is what are they gonna use for tutoring, okay? See, you, you need to know how the child learns and processes information before you can figure out what tutoring is going to be needed if necessary and how much and what the skill sets are okay. that the person needs. So I wouldn't just go into it blind with a tutor, mm -hmm. but you can ask for an evaluation early. You don't have to take a wait and see approach. You can just say, you can say there's a history of this in my family and I'm going to get it checked early, period. How often do you see that being successful that a school agrees to that? Uh, but, uh, put, uh, yeah, put put the re, put the request in writing, uh -huh. and 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 just flat out say that you you want an evaluation done. You'll still have to wait your 60 days and all that, but just get it early. Okay. And you can do it just simply on you know I I don't think things are right, and I want to I want to be proactive. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>